So let's go ahead and start. So this is the second lecture on uh, introducing you to some of the science in plasma astrophysics. So last time I tried to use the topic of outflows from stars to introduce a variety of different physical concepts that show up in a wide range of different problems in astrophysics. So the goal today is in some ways similar, but I'm going to kind of use a different set of techniques and a different set of problems. In particular, I'm going to focus on studying uh, certain linear instabilities which show up in a range of different astrophysical contexts. And the goal um, is both to introduce you to a little bit of the physics of the linear instabilities, how to think about them, why we care about linear instabilities, um, and in particular to do this in the context of two classes of instabilities, instabilities driven by buoyancy, so density differences between fu fluids or plasmas, which drive instabilities, that's convection, and then instabilities driven by differential rotation. Uh, and as with last time, I'd encourage you to please feel free to ask me questions as I go. You don't need to wait till the end. So we're at a, a workshop on kind of numerical methods for plasma astrophysics. I feel a little bit like I have to defend linear theory, like who cares about linear theory? Jim actually was very kind in his lecture, and actually I kind of am going to remember this and quote him on this, that basically numerical simulations are just studying the nonlinear saturation of linear instabilities. That's a slight paraphrase, but uh, just, I added a just. Um, so, uh, so I'll give you a little bit of context about why linear instabilities are relevant, you know, especially given modern computing power, which really does allow us to tackle problems that are far harder than we can tackle with linear perturbation theory. And then I'll focus really, as I said, on these two types of instabilities, buoyancy and differential rotation. Buoyancy is particularly relevant for convection in stars. That's one of the dominant energy transport mechanisms in stars. And as I'll show you, it turns out to also be very relevant for dilute plasmas that show up in other astrophysical contexts, like the hot plasma that fills the space between galaxies in galaxy clusters, or that fills the halo of galaxies like the Milky Way. And then instabilities driven by differential rotation are particularly important in accretion disks. So a little bit of kind of broader context about why thinking about linear instabilities are important. Uh, linear instabilities and understanding what classes of linear instabilities a particular system you're interested in or subject to are extremely instructive for identifying what the important physics is. One way to think about this is you can never, in any astrophysical problem, include all of the physics that's really relevant in the real astrophysical system. And so understanding what physics to include is actually a very important part of setting up the problem you want to study. And knowing what physics is important in the context of linear instabilities is one way to approach that question. Um, in terms of the actual impact on the systems we're interested in, the critical role of linear instabilities is that they produce a way of generating turbulence that redistributes mass, momentum, magnetic fields, energy, chemical composition, so species. And so they really rearrange the structure and dynamics of the system that you're studying. And in that highly nonlinear turbulent state that results from the outcome of linear instabilities, the physics that's present in the underlying linear instability is often still there. When we worry about energy transport by convection in stars, we're worrying in a nonlinear state about how buoyancy density and temperature differences between fluid elements transports energy, and that's fundamentally related to the mechanism of the linear instability that got things going in the first place. So at the end of the day, in the turbulent state, the, linear in the properties of the linear instability remain. And then perhaps most importantly is that the presence of linear instabilities fundamentally changes the equilibrium you thought you had. 
The simplest model for the expansion of the universe is a Friedman Walker Robertson model, where a roughly homogeneous isotropic universe expands uh, with some Hubble parameter as a function of time. That universe is gravitationally unstable. Small linear perturbations are amplified in time due to the action of gravitational instability. They're not amplified exponentially, they're amplified power law, that's a property of the expanding universe, but they're amplified in time, and it's that amplification by gravitational instability that actually produces the galaxies and large-scale structure that we see. And understanding the nonlinear state of gravitational instability is really at the heart of understanding galaxy formation. Ditto for star formation. It's more complicated than just gravitational instability. You see these explosions, right? That's feedback. That's the fact that once gravitational instability starts to form structures like stars and black holes, those release a lot of energy, which have a huge impact on the resulting evolution of the system. But the fundamental thing that gets galaxy formation and star formation going, and that is, you know, really the crit critical physics involved is gravitational instability in the case of uh, the universe or galaxy formation in the uh, expanding universe. The other classic example where we actually understand things much better, there's a lot we don't understand about galaxy formation, the, the really classic example is convection in stars. You write down a model of stars where energy transport is by photons, and you can predict everything about the properties of stars, and your predictions are wrong. You don't get the radii, temperature, luminosities, et cetera, of stars correct. And the reason is that the equilibrium structure predicted by models with just photon diffusion are unstable. They're unstable to buoyancy, to convection, and that's actually a critical mechanism of transporting energy and completely rearranging the structure of the star. So the reason that theoretical models, one of the reasons they get the structure, the radius of the sun and the structure of the sun correct is because they take into account that the outer 30% by radius of the sun is convective as we actually see imprinted on the surface of the sun. Okay, now in thinking about what types of instabilities afflict astrophysical systems, so you have some hypothesized equilibrium state that describes your system, when you worry about what instabilities are present, you have to think about what regime of astrophysical plasma physics that Matt has described to you, what regime are we in? Are we in a regime where ideal fluid mechanics is applicable, ideal MHD? Do we need to worry about non-ideal effects? Is it a completely collisionless plasma, et cetera? And something I already stressed last time and that Matt stressed is that in astrophysics, we really cover the entire gamut of the theories that Matt talked about. In systems like this astonishing Alma image of HLL tau, right, these are disks around newly forming stars where planets are forming. These are relatively cool, weakly ionized systems that are not well described by ideal MHD. So non-ideal effects are very important. The Hall effect, ambipolar diffusion, resistivity, stuff that Matt talked about. Likewise, it's not actually just a gas or a plasma of neutrals and ionized particles. There's also these much larger things, dust grains, that are very important for the dynamics, certainly very important for understanding planet formation. So it's really a multi-fluid system consisting of neutrals, electrons, ionized ions, and larger dust grains. In a system like galaxy clusters, we're in a very different regime. It's very hot, very low density. The collisional mean-free path is very long, and so we have to worry about non-ideal effects like conduction and viscosity, as Matt described to you. And then in systems like quasars, so very luminous accreting black holes radiating near the Eddington limit, the energy density in radiation close to the black hole greatly exceeds the energy density in gas. And so it's another two fluid system, but where the two fluids are now the radiation and the ionized plasma. And so the techniques, the kind of physics that you have to worry about, 
is very different in these systems, and likewise, the numerical methods that you need to worry about are very different. So for instance, Jim described some of the basic numerical techniques for magnetohydrodynamics, which is a starting point for all of these systems in his first lecture, and in his second lecture, he's gonna focus on radiation MHD, radiation hydrodynamics, which is particularly important for this system. So this is just to stress that just like thinking about the numerical simulations, the physics that's involved, likewise, when we worry about is our assumed equilibrium stable or not in doing linear perturbation theory, we have to be careful to make sure we're including the right physics, which varies a lot from system to system. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna transition and start to talk specifically about the case of instabilities associated with buoyancy. This is the fundamental physics uh, that drives convection. And I'll first talk about kind of the relatively standard theory of convection as applies in stars. And then I'll transition to some more unusual types of convection associated with thermal conduction, which is particularly interested in hot dilute plasmas like in galaxy clusters. So, the basic setup in thinking about whether or not a system is unstable due to buoyancy is as follows. Imagine you have a gravitational field pointing downwards like this. There's some fluid element, a nice circle here. It initially has some density, pressure, temperature, entropy. And then we ask the question, imagine perturbing this fluid element up in some to some other height in the gravitational field. At that new position, is it less dense than its surroundings? If it's less dense than its surroundings, it will be buoyant, it'll continue to rise. On the other hand, if at the new position, it's more dense than its surroundings, then it'll be heavy and it'll sink. That's the basic question we wanna answer. The condition that I'll kind of heuristically derive for you now, uh, the condition for convection in stars is that the system is convectively unstable when there's a negative entropy gradient in your background state, meaning that the setup is like this, that there's higher entropy deeper down in the gravitational potential. That's the setup that's unstable. This turns out not to be generically true. This is not a generic uh, condition for convection. It's a specific condition for con convection that holds in the interiors of astronomical objects like stars and planets. And it holds really because there's two assumptions that are well satisfied deep in the interiors of stars and planets. One is that when you have boiling motion, those motions are very slow compared to the speed of sound. And that means there's lots of time for sound waves to bounce around and maintain approximate pressure equilibrium uh, at a given place in the star. So there's a background pressure gradient. The pressure is higher in the center of the star than in the surface of the star. But at a given radius, the pressure is roughly the same everywhere. Um, on the other hand, the time scale for boiling motions in the interiors of stars is very long compared to the time scale for energy to diffuse around by photons, and that means the motions are adiabatic. So there's actually a very nice hierarchy of time scales, for instance, in the interior of the sun. The sound crossing time is about an hour. The time scale for the sun to boil in the interior is about a month, and the time scale for photons to diffuse energy around is tens of thousands of years. So this nice hierarchy implies that there's pressure equilibrium with the surroundings and that the motions are adiabatic. And the reason this is important is now that I've told you how as this blob moves from one position to another, I've told you how its pressure changes and how its entropy changes. I've specified its thermodynamic state. So I've also told you what its density is. So I've told you whether it's buoyant or not. So specifically, as the fluid element moves from its initial position to its final position, it's always at the same pressure as everything around it. So at this new place, there's a background pressure P prime, background density rho prime, entropy S prime, and the pressure of the blob is the same as its surroundings. That's this pressure equilibrium assumption. 
On the other hand, the motions being adiabatic means that at the new position, the entropy is the same as what it started with. So you preserve the entropy as the fluid moves around. And that means that the entropy of an ideal gas is just given by this expression, log of p over rho to the gamma. So if the pressure is the same, and if this blob moves from a region of high entropy to low entropy, at this new place, the entropy of the blob is larger than the surroundings. The only way you can have the same pressure but higher entropy is to have lower density. And so this setup, high entropy deep down, low entropy further out, if the motions are adiabatic and in pressure equilibrium, that inevitably means when you do a perturbation like this, that this fluid element will be less dense than its surroundings at this new place. If it's less dense than its surroundings, buoyancy will continue to accelerate it up. So the setup that we've drawn here is in fact linearly unstable at this new place. The density is less than the surroundings, and so there's actually an exponentially growing instability which will cause the blob to run away. And that's the essence of the convective instability. And so this is one of the things that's a little confusing when you first are introduced to convection in stars is we talk about whether convection sets in or not depends on whether or not the background entropy gradient is negative or positive. Negative entropy gradient is unstable for the reasons I've given here. Positive entropy gradient is stable. And what's confusing is that buoyancy, which is driving the instability, cares about density differences. So why is it that we're worried about the entropy gradient? And the fundamental reason we're worried about the entropy gradient comes through these assumptions, pressure equilibrium and adiabatic motions. Those tell us that whether or not the blob is denser or less dense in its surroundings is governed by the background entropy gradient in the fluid. Okay, so this is what people do when you make a model of a star. You first ignore convection, you calculate the structure of the star using fusion and energy transport by photons and all that stuff, and then you ask the question, is the model that I predicted by neglecting convection, is it actually stable or not? Is the entropy gradient of that model negative or positive? If it's negative, the model is inconsistent because the system is actually unstable and you need to take into account convection. And in the old days, at least, stellar structure models literally were written with if-then statements. If the entropy gradient's negative, it's convective, you do something else. Okay. So that's the kind of basic linear theory described in pictures rather than actually doing linear perturbation theory on these equations. And I'll come back to showing you in a, a little bit, I'll describe to you the connection between this kind of pictorial way of thinking about it and a slightly more technical way of thinking about it. But this gets the essence of the idea across. Now this is missing one aspect of buoyancy, or it's not missing, it's hidden, it's not obvious. What's another setup that you're actually familiar with in everyday experience in which you have uh, buoyancy is important? So we're talking here about differences in entropy, but what's something you can do in everyday experience that sets up uh, a buoyantly unstable situation? temperature gradient, but entropy gradient is temperature gradient. So you're thinking that in everyday experience, systems are unstable because of the temperature gradient, and that's actually not true. Systems are unstable because of the entropy gradient. The temperature gradient is part of that. Chemical composition, exactly. You can put a heavy fluid in a light fluid, and it'll sink. And so this is Differences in chemical composition are another way of generating buoyancy. The classic example of that, of which this is a simulation, is called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, 
where you have a discontinuous jump in composition, heavy stuff on top of light stuff. The heavy stuff sinks, it creates these fingering motions, and that starts to saturate in something that looks like this numerical simulation. So how do I understand that in the context of this argument? So let's think about the role of composition in the argument that we just gave. Same setup, gravity points down. The condition for convection is this negative entropy gradient. Entropy depends on pressure and density. The key thing, and I'm going to focus here on an ideal gas relevant in the interiors of stars. The key thing to realize is that the pressure of an ideal gas depends on its composition. So the way we write this is that the pressure of an ideal gas is NKT, but if you have material with different compositions, then there's a bunch of different densities you have to worry about. There's the density of fluid one, fluid two, fluid three, et cetera. I'm gonna assume we're in thermal equilibrium, so everything has the same temperature, just to simplify life. So the pressure in general for an ideal gas that has a bunch of different components is you have to add up NKT for all of the components. And the way we write this is rather than keep track of separately NKT for all the different components, we can kind of define this sum to be rho KT, the mass density times KT, divided by some effective average mass per particle. So mu KT is the average mass per particle that encapsulates the fact that I've summed over all species. And mu is called the mean molecular weight, or more kind of physically, it's just the average mass per particle. And this depends on what the material you're talking about is made of. For ionized hydrogen, mu is a half. You get one NKT from electrons. You get one NKT from protons. The densities are equal by charge neutrality. So the average mass per particle is actually half the mass of the proton um, because you have an equal contribution to the pressure from the electrons that don't contribute any mass. Ionized helium, the average mass per particle is four-thirds the mass of the proton. Solar metallicity, so kind of cosmic composition, mu is about 0.62. So what we can do then is we can just expand out this entropy derivative. So ds dz, if I just expand that out, is d log p dz minus gamma d log rho dz. But now I'm just going to substitute in. I'm going to get rid of the pressure in favor of the density and temperature. And I'm going to include the fact that there can be a background composition gradient. I take dp dz, I take d rho dz, dt dz, and d mu dz, composition gradient. So the entropy gradient has a temperature part, a density part, but also a composition part. And if you check the signs of everything here, so the system is unstable if the entropy gradient is negative. That means the system is unstable if this composition gradient term is positive. The composition gradient being positive, d mu dz being positive, means you have heavy stuff on top of light stuff. It's like having helium on top of hydrogen. And so that's unstable, just as we would expect. And so that's where the composition gradients come in. And this is really the continuous version of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. The Rayleigh-Taylor instability is a discontinuous, the kind of standard version that you often see, is a discontinuous transition of fluid, you know, water and air. Um, but in convection, we have kind of uniform, or we have smooth gradients, and smooth composition gradients can drive instability just like discontinuous composition gradients, and this is how it manifests itself. Okay, and this is very, very relevant in stars, for instance, right? So stars, you have nuclear fusion in the interior that converts light elements into heavy elements. So the standard situation that you end up with in stellar evolution is actually heavy stuff on the inside, light stuff on the outside, and that's actually stabilizing. So the standard composition gradients 
that show up kind of as a course of stellar evolution actually act to stabilize convection. You still get lots of convection in stars, but they tend to be stabilized by composition gradients. Okay. So what I want to talk about now, again, focusing still on the case of stars, oops, is what happens and under what conditions do some of these assumptions that we made here actually fail? And in particular, the one I'm going to focus on is when our assumption that the motions are adiabatic fails. And that turns out to happen at the surfaces of stars. So here's the physical argument. The time scale for photons to diffuse at distance h and h here I'm taking to be the local scale height of the system, the length scale over which density, pressure, temperature, something like that changes by order unity. So it's kind of locally what is the scale on which the system looks homogeneous. The time scale for photons to diffuse a distance h is the distance you want to travel squared divided by the photon mean free path speed of light, standard photon diffusion argument. And I can write this as h over c times this ratio of the scale of the system h divided by the photon mean free path. That's a dimensionless number which measures the kind of size of the mean free path. And this is, again, this parameter, the optical depth that we talked about uh, last time. By contrast, what is the time scale for things to boil? Well, convective motions are in general subsonic. You don't have convection moving around at much faster than the speed of sound. That would generate huge shocks, which would be very dissipative. And so convection at best tends to move at about the speed of sound. In the interior of the sun, just to give you a feel, you know, deep in the interior of the sun, at the base of the convection zone, which is at 0.7 times the radius of the sun, the convective speed is a thousand times smaller than the speed of sound. So very, very subsonic. That means that the time scale for convection is longer than the, time, the distance you're moving h divided by the speed of sound. And so we can ask the question, when does the photon diffusion time become less than the time scale for things to boil? And that turns out to happen when the optical depth is less than a critical dimensionless number, which is the speed of light divided by the speed of sound. What does that mean? The surface of a star, the place where the photons we see come from, is where the optical depth is one. The place we see photons come from is where the photons stop bouncing around and travel on straight lines. So that's an optical depth of one. And that means that Somewhere between the surface, where the optical depth is 1, and the place where the optical depth is this number, speed of light divided by speed of sound, which might be 1,000 or something like that, typically in stars, um, the photon diffusion time will be less than the fastest the convective eddies can move around. And that means the motions will be non-adiabatic. And so our assumption, our fundamental assumption, in deriving the condition for convection will fail. It will no longer be valid to assume adiabatic motions near the surfaces of stars. And that's just because near the surfaces, photons are getting out fast, so you can't assume things are adiabatic anymore. You have this rapid thermal diffusion. So let's go back to our argument and ask, how does this change? How does our nice heuristic argument change um, when we introduce this rapid thermal diffusion. Actually, let me make just a very side point. This is a technical point. But these diagrams, you might think these are just for the purposes of talks. But actually, if you look at papers on linear instabilities, what you'll see is a lot of math, which is deriving the linear instability. And then you'll see a lot of pictures like this, which is trying to give heuristic physical understanding of the instabilities. So this is not just kind of diagrams for the purposes of talks. These are very similar to what you'll see in papers trying to describe the physics of the instability. OK, that was a slight aside. But. So again, this is the assumption we made before in thinking about convection. We said the entropy as I move a fluid element from one place to another, 
entropy is conserved, it's adiabatic, and so the entropy you end up with at your final position is the entropy you start with. That's not true anymore because the motions aren't adiabatic. Instead, when you have rapid conduction, rapid thermal diffusion, remember, don't worry about the B hats now, but heat fluxes care about temperature gradients. So when you have rapid diffusion, what that tends to do is wipe out temperature gradients. So in the limit of very rapid diffusion, instead of the entropy of the fluid element being the same as what it started is, what rapid thermal diffusion tries to do is it tries to make the temperature the same everywhere. So it tries to make the temperature of this blob the same as the temperature of the surroundings. Wherever you are, when you have rapid thermal diffusion, it tries to equilibrate the temperature. So that's the action of rapid thermal diffusion, this non-adiabatic limit, is to try to make the temperature roughly the same as the background wherever the fluid element is. If I drew the fluid element here, the temperature of the blob would be the same as the background here. If I drew the fluid element up here, the temperature would be the same as the background at that place. Okay. So the key thing to notice now is that what I've said is at this position, I'm assuming my motions are sort of slow, so the pressure is always the same as the background. And now I've told you the temperature of the blob is about the same as its surroundings. That means for an ideal gas, the density is the same as its surroundings. Pressure is NKT. If the pressure is the same as the surroundings and the temperature is the same as the surroundings, then the density is the same as the surroundings. What that means is that rapid thermal diffusion, rapid isotropic thermal diffusion, that word isotropic will be important in a minute, Rapid isotropic thermal diffusion tends to suppress buoyancy. It tends to wipe out temperature gradients, which because things are in pressure equilibrium, also tends to wipe out density differences, which weakens the effects of buoyancy. And this effect is very important in the surface layers of stars. And understanding what this does to convection in the surface layers of stars is actually a very active area of research. Uh, people who model the surface of the sun uh, and do numerical simulations of the surface of the sun, one of the major things they quantify is this suppression of buoyancy in numerical simulations by rapid energy loss near the surface of the sun. Uh, likewise, a former student of Jim's Jim Stones, Yan Fei Zhang, has been studying convection in the surface layers of massive stars and trying to understand the kind of dynamic properties of the photospheres of massive stars with an eye towards understanding how does this change stellar winds and things like that. This is a simulation using the radiation hydrodynamic techniques that Jim will talk about uh, next week. Uh, this surfaces of massive stars are complicated because you have strong radiation pressure and rapid thermal diffusion. And so you really need the numerical techniques that Jim will talk about to model this kind of system. This movie shows you density, so you see this very dynamic surface of massive stars. This plot quantifies for you the suppression of energy transport near the surfaces of massive stars by the effect that I just talked about. So what this shows is the convective flux, the energy transported by convection, in units of the radiative flux, the energy transported by photons, for simulations at three different places in the star. The simulations are very creatively named, deep, mid, and top. You can probably guess what those mean. Deep is deep in the star, top is near the top of the star, mid is somewhere in between. And what this shows you is that in the deep interior, deep mid, these curves, convection carries an amount of energy which is similar to what photons was car were carrying. But near the surface, when you have convection near the surface of stars, convection actually is not very efficient at carrying energy. The energy transport by convection is down by almost two orders of magnitude. And that's because of the suppression of buoyancy in the surface layers where thermal diffusion is very rapid. 
Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah, so what is done, so this is, a, this is a local simulation. There's a constant gravitational field, so it's not like a full star. You can see the local box. Um, this is the initial condition, and one of the things, so this is a color scale is density. So one of the things you'll notice is red is high density, light, dark blue, sorry, is low density, light blue is somewhere in between. So the initial conditions have this weird property that the density drops and then it goes up again. This is a property of the surface layers of massive stars for a certain range of temperature, and it's driven by the dependence of the opacity, how photons interact with matter on temperature. So the initial condition is taken from a stellar model. It looks like this. This, it turns out, is convectively unstable. Again, this is kind of heavy stuff on top of light stuff, so it's convectively unstable. And then it does reach, you're exactly right, it reaches a new statistical steady state. So at the end of the day, the steady state you reach is one where there's actually vigorous turbulence, large fluctuations in density. You still have in this statistical steady state, there's an average sense in which there is heavy stuff on top of light stuff. You have this kind of reddish, darker, sorry, reddish, lighter blue stuff on top of darker blue stuff. But this is the statistical steady state the system wants to go to, exactly. And so the questions, uh, I'm actually working on this with uh, Jan Fay. So the questions we're interested in understanding is, is this turbulence detectable when you look at the surfaces of massive stars, either look at the light as a function of time, flux perturbations, or do spectroscopy? Or I think the most interesting question is, how does this change mass loss? Does this change the predictions of mass loss rates from massive stars? Because you have this very, very dynamic photosphere. The, the turbulent velocities are almost 100 kilometers a second in this simulation. So it's a really active photosphere. So it's not, uh, so yeah, good question. Is the statistical steady state, does it depend on the initial density fluctuations, or any initial perturbations that you put in? And the answer to that is basically no. And that's often, not always, but often a property of systems that are linearly unstable. You have an instability that grows exponentially, and so it loses memory of its initial condition. So what it does depend on, for instance, is it does depend on We've done calculations where you add a strong magnetic field to the system, and that does change things. So I will just mention, uh, back to this dependence on initial conditions, the expanding universe is a case where the outcome of gravitational instability does depend on the initial conditions, and that's really because things don't grow exponentially. They only grow as a power law, so you actually care about the amplitude you started at. So the boundary condition at the bottom face is there's a constant flux that's put into the system. So you're specifying that the deep interior of the star fusion is setting some flux that's coming out, and then there's a fixed density. But the key, the key I think, is the constant flux. Periodic boundary conditions here, and then both radiation and matter can leave the surface. Although, as you can see, not much matter actually wants to leave the surface here. Yep. Yes, that's right. That's right. So these three simulations correspond effectively to different optical depths in the, in the simulation. These two are in the regime where the optical depth is large compared to this number. So things are relatively adiabatic. So convection is efficient at carrying energy. The, the one that's near the top of the star is a low optical depth. And so convection is not very efficient at carrying energy. OK. So that is kind of what we've been talking about at the end there, is thinking about how does the microscopic transport of energy affect
the macroscopic turbulent dynamics, the convection in stars. And that's focusing on energy transport by photons because energy transport by photons is the dominant microscopic energy transport mechanism in normal stars. And physically, that's basically because the cross-section, the probability that photons interact with matter is much less than the probability that matter interacts with matter. The mean free path of an electron to run into a proton is much less than the mean free path of a photon in the deep interior of the sun. And that's because the Coulomb cross-section that describes electron-proton interactions is much larger than the Thomson cross-section that describes photon-electron interactions. That's why photons dominate the energy transport in normal stars like the sun. But that turns out not to be true in other astrophysical situations. In other astrophysical situations, electron thermal conduction, so random walking electrons rather than random walking photons, are the dominant microscopic energy transport mechanism. That's true, for instance, in white dwarfs and neutron stars. In white dwarfs and neutron stars, the thermal conduction, random walking particles, are the dominant energy transport mechanism. And in hot, low-density plasmas, like the solar corona or certain models of accretion disks around black holes or galaxy clusters, the dominant microscopic energy transport mechanism for diffusing energy around is, again, thermal conduction. In fact, in neutron stars, in the interiors of neutron stars, it's actually neutron conduction, because it's mostly neutrons, that's the dominant energy transport mechanism. Okay. Why is this distinction important? Well, photons, photon energy transport in the interiors of stars doesn't care about the magnetic field. For the conditions in the interiors of stars, how photons interact with matter is independent of anything to do with the magnetic field strength. The cross-sections don't care about the magnetic field. That's not true for charged particles. We've seen from that and some of the stuff that Michael talked about in the context of fusion, that charged particles, because how they move around magnetic field lines, right, they can move very effectively along magnetic field lines, but not move effectively across magnetic field lines because of Larmor motion. So in the solar corona, in galaxy clusters, et cetera, the electron mean free path is much larger than the electron Larmor radius, so conduction is very anisotropic. Energy transport is very effective along magnetic field lines. It's not effective across magnetic field lines. Uh, in degenerate conditions, this condition turns out to be harder to satisfy. And the reason for that is the systems are very dense, so the electron mean free path is actually quite small. So getting the electron mean free path larger than the electron Larmor radius in a white dwarf or a neutron star requires magnetic field strengths greater than about a billion gauss. That's large for a white dwarf, but not large for a neutron star. So what that means is typically in white dwarfs, thermal conduction is still pretty isotropic. It doesn't care about direction. And that's because we're in the regime where the mean free path is smaller than the Larmor radius. By contrast, a typical neutron star has a 10 to the 12 gauss magnetic field. So near the surface of the typical neutron star, the electron mean free path is larger than the Larmor radius. So conduction is, again, very anisotropic. Heat gets transported along magnetic field lines much more efficiently than it gets transported across magnetic field lines. Yeah, so the question is, what is the process that controls the electron mean free path? It's electron-proton collisions. So the, roughly speaking, actually this is pretty accurate, the cross-section for electron-proton collisions in a degenerate plasma is the same here, except you replace the thermal energy KT with the Fermi energy, okay? Because the typical electron energy is now the Fermi energy but it's still electron-proton collisions. At least, yeah, under, let's not, under typical conditions, that's the case. Any other questions? Okay. So the reason for emphasizing this is that what it means is if we want to go back and think about the effects of diffusive heat transport, then in stars, 
It's okay to say, okay, there's one direction determined by gravity, that's the only direction that matters. I don't have to worry about diffusion being different in different directions. But in low density dilute plasmas where electron thermal conduction is important, I have to worry about the fact that heat transport is different in different directions. And that turns out to be surprisingly interesting, that anisotropic thermal conduction the fact that heat is transported along magnetic field lines fundamentally changes the properties of convection in dilute plasmas. And so I want to describe to you a little bit of the physics of that and then some of the application of this to galaxy clusters. And this was uh, first recognized by Steve Balbus in the early 2000s um, in a couple of papers where he studied the problem that I'll describe to you here. So the problem, the setup that I want you to consider is basically the same setup as before. We have a gravitational field pointing down. There's initially a blob that has some density, temperature, or pressure. For reasons that will become clear, what I'm going to care about is that it's hot down here and cold up here, not that it's high entropy, low entropy, but actually what the temperature is, not what the entropy is. And then the wrinkle I'm going to introduce is now that I'm going to introduce a weak magnetic field in this direction. The magnetic field is the dotted line. Okay. And by weak, what I mean is that the magnetic field is so weak that the forces, the Lorentz forces, tension, all that stuff is irrelevant. The only thing that the magnetic field does in this problem that's important is that the heat only flows along the direction of the magnetic field. That's what it does. Okay, so now I move the blob to a new position and I'm going to assume that we're in a regime where the time scale for thermal conduction to move energy along the magnetic field line. And remember, because magnetic fields are frozen into the plasma, if the blob moves up, the magnetic field line is bent too. So the magnetic field and the plasma move together. So at the new position, the magnetic field will look something like this, heuristically. Okay. Um, and I'm going to assume that the time scale for thermal conduction to transport energy along this magnetic field line is much smaller than the time scale it took to rise, for the blob to rise up. And what that means is just like we argued in the case of diffusion by photons in stars, thermal conduction is fast enough that it wants the temperature to be the same. And the only difference now is that because the flow of heat is only along the magnetic field, okay, what thermal conduction wants to do is it wants to keep this magnetic field line at the same temperature. It doesn't want to keep everything at the same temperature because heat is not distributed in every direction. It's only distributed along magnetic field lines. And what that means is at this new position, the final temperature you end up with is the temperature you started with because the magnetic field line has the same temperature everywhere in the limit of rapid thermal conduction. So at this new position, the blob has a pressure which is the same as the surrounding medium it has a temperature which is equal to the initial temperature where it started. That means at this new place, the blob is hotter than its surroundings by assumption, because I'm assuming it's hotter down here than it is up here. The blob at this position is hotter than its surroundings. It's at the same pressure as its surroundings. And that means that it's less dense than its surroundings. And so it's convectively unstable. So hotter than its surroundings, less dense than its surroundings, it's convectively unstable. So this is really amazing, right? By only introducing this asymmetry into the problem, where the heat doesn't flow the same in every direction, but it only flows preferentially along the direction of the magnetic field, we've changed the problem from one in which rapid diffusion wipes out buoyancy and kind of gets rid of convection to one in which rapid diffusion actually generates convection. And the condition for convective instability now is not that the entropy gradient is negative, 
It's that the temperature gradient is negative. Hot deep down, cold further up is the setup that's convectively unstable. Okay. So let me just show you an example of a numerical simulation of this. Uh, so this is using, uh, actually this is using Athena, of course. Um, and it's using uh, simulations that explicitly include anisotropic thermal conduction. And there's actually some interesting numerical subtleties for including uh, this type of heat flux in numerical simulations. When you discretize it, you have to make sure that you discretize it in a way that doesn't allow uh, heat to heat flow to violate the laws of thermodynamics. You can numerically do that even if the equations don't solve it. So there's some subtleties involved in doing this numerically that I'm not going to go into. But the setup in the simulation is exactly the setup I showed you before. And the simulation, as you'll see, basically looks like any other simulation of convection. You get these interpenetrating blobs that start to boil. The magnetic field lines are the black lines. Of course, they get wrapped up by flux freezing. As the fluid boils around, the magnetic field lines get wrapped up. And that actually amplifies the energy in the magnetic field. So if you start with a weak magnetic field, the energy in the magnetic field actually grows in time due to this boiling motion. So this is a form of dynamo amplifying the strength of the magnetic field. And you end up with, again, a statistical steady state where you have this turbulent motion transporting energy. OK. So what I want to do now is I want to take a few minutes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Right, you mean there's like a flow here and a flow here. Um, good question. I actually don't remember if that is random or a property of the initial condition. Jim? It's probably a property of the mode. It's yeah. The size of the yeah, so good, good question. I'm actually not, I'm not sure. Yeah, any other questions? So I'll come back in a second to this in the context of uh, astrophysical systems like galaxy clusters. What I wanted to do actually is I, I wanted to take a second because I think there's sometimes a disconnect between actually doing linear perturbation theory in the sense of the math and drawing pictures like this that explain the math. So what I wanted to do is take a second and actually explain to you how all of the words and arrows and pictures and everything I've drawn here actually manifests itself in the math when we take these equations and actually do linear perturbation theory. So I'm not going to do the full perturbation theory calculation, but I'll sketch out some of the key steps so that you can see the connection between the assumptions that are made here and how that actually manifests itself in the linear perturbation theory calculation. All right. So here's the, can we, can everybody see the board okay? No? Okay, can you turn the lights up a little more? Okay, better? Okay. Sorry, what? Make sure to write big, yes, I will. So these are the equations that we're solving. These are the equations that are actually solved in that numerical simulation. These are the equations of Braginsky MHD. So this is the equations of MHD, including anisotropic thermal conduction and viscosity. So we have conservation of mass. We have the momentum equation, which has the Lorentz force. There's a viscous term. So pi here is this Braginsky viscosity anisotropic viscosity, pressure gradient gravity, the induction equation, and then conservation of entropy, where the key term in this problem actually is this anisotropic conduction. So there's a heat flux, which is only a long magnetic field line. So remember the flow of heat, Q, 
is in the direction of B, and it only cares about temperature gradients that are along the magnetic field direction. So the heat flux is B hat, B hat, dot grad T. Okay. So first of all, what does it mean that I have a weak magnetic field that has no dynamical effect, it only channels the heat flow? What that means is that I'm dropping this term. I'm ignoring the magnetic, the Lorentz force. I'm ignoring magnetic pressure and magnetic tension. And you can check after the fact when that's a good assumption. For, vi for weak enough magnetic fields, that is a good assumption. The magnetic forces are small compared to the buoyancy forces, so you can neglect the magnetic forces. The second thing, and this is actually a bit subtle, and it's one of the trickier parts sometimes of doing these linear perturbation theory calculations, is we've assumed pressure equilibrium with surroundings. That's a critical assumption that showed up in every one of these pictures, that as a blob moves around, it's in pressure equilibrium with its surroundings. This is actually something that mathematically uh, is known as the Boussinesq approximation in the fluid dynamics literature. It shows up a lot also in geophysical fluid dynamics. And what it, what it really means physically is that we keep density perturbations due to buoyancy, but not sound waves. We assume that sound waves travel around so quickly that they wipe out pressure differences. And the way, the way it turns out you can implement this, and I'm not gonna derive this for you, so you can check this. This is, is we assume divergence of V equals zero replaces definitely not used to working with boards like this okay so we've dropped this so we assume that divergence of v equals 0 replaces this equation So what does that mean? So at first glance, that's weird because strictly speaking, divergence of V equals zero is only true for an incompressible fluid, but we're interested in buoyancy, which is differences in density. So why are we taking this kind of incompressible limit? And what we're really doing, and this is the part that I'm not showing you, what we're really doing is we're making a time scale assumption that sound waves are very fast compared to everything else in the problem. And you can show formally by doing an expansion, you can show formally that in that limit, what you do is you drop density fluctuations driven by sound waves, which is setting divergence of E equals zero, but you keep density perturbations associated with gravity, which is buoyancy. Okay. And this is actually not required to do this calculation. It just simplifies the algebra greatly because it gets sound waves out of the problem. If you don't do this, then you have sound waves floating around in the problem, which just means there's a lot more algebra you have to do. Um, okay. So the setup, the simplest linear perturbation theory setup, again, is gravity points down. The magnetic field is in the, I'm going to call this the x direction, and this the z direction. 
and my perturbation, it turns out the simplest setup, is my perturbation is also in the x direction. So remember, what we're doing is we're taking this equation and we're assuming that everything varies in time and space as e to the minus i omega t plus i dot kx. So we're basically Fourier transforming in time and space. And the, the simplest version of the calculation that captures a lot of the physics is to say that k is in the x direction. Yeah? Raise the font size. Raise the font size. So that's a little hard to do now after the fact here. Uh, but I will do so as I go on. Thank you. OK. My goodness. Let's go over here. So the key bit of physics here is the heat flux. It's this anisotropic flow of heat in the heuristic picture. That's what changed our condition for convective instability. So what I want to do is I want to perturb this heat flux. So what is the change in heat flux? And as Matt already described to you, when you do linear perturbation theory, there's actually two different types of perturbation theory you can do, Eulerian perturbation theory and Lagrangian perturbation theory. Eulerian perturbation theory is at a fixed place. Lagrangian perturbation theory is moving with the flow. These deltas are Eulerian perturbations at a fixed place. So this is So I'm just going to write out all of the terms. So I have three contributions to this perturbation. I can perturb B hat, first B hat, second B hat, or temperature. Okay. So the, this first term, this is the perturbation to the direction of the magnetic field. And this is the background B hat dotted into grad T. But our setup is that B is in the X direction, temperature gradient is in the z direction, so this is zero. For our simplified initial condition, that b hat dot grad t is actually equal to zero. So I just have to worry about the second and third terms. So what I need to calculate now is what is this change in magnetic field direction? So remember, b hat is the, direct, is the magnitude of b, sorry, is b vector divided by the magnitude of b. And that can change either because the direction of b changes or because the magnitude of b changes. So the magnitude of B, when I do my perturbation, is B naught squared plus 2 B naught dot delta B plus delta B naught squared square root. Okay, this is zero in linear perturbation theory because we ignore nonlinear terms. So the question is, what is this contribution, B naught dot delta B? And in this particular setup, from divergence of B equals zero, K dot delta B is equal to zero. K is just in the x direction. So that means Kx delta Bx is equal to 0, which means delta Bx is equal to 0. But our initial magnetic field is just in the x direction. So that means this dot product is also 0. Again, just for this setup. 
it's zero. And that means that the change in the direction of the magnetic field delta b hat is just delta b vector divided by b naught. There's no change in the magnitude of the magnetic field. All right. So the last thing I want to do is I want to rewrite delta b hat in terms of other properties of the problem. And I'm going to do that using the induction equation. So dB dt is curl of V cross B. This in general has, you expand out the curl, it in general has four contributions. Two of them vanish if divergence of B and divergence of V are zero. So this turns out to only have two contributions, and that's B dot grad V minus V dot grad B. So the second term, v dot grad b, is zero for our setup. And the reason is that in linear theory, I have to have b be delta b, because there's no background gradient in the magnetic field. But then this could only be non-zero if there's a finite equilibrium velocity. It would need to be v naught dot grad delta b, which is zero. Okay, great. So that simplifies our life. So that means this takes the form minus I omega, so now doing the Fourier transform, minus I omega delta B is equal to, so B dot grad is just K, so this is I, K, B naught, delta V. Okay, almost there. I assume, by the way, this is incredibly familiar because you all did what Matt asked you to do in doing linear per perturbation theory late at night. Okay. All right, so I just want to rewrite this expression. So when we draw a picture like this and I say the fluid element moves from there to there, that actually mathematically corresponds to a particular quantity in perturbation theory, which is called the fluid displacement, C. And this is defined by the perturbation to the velocity delta V is just d psi dt. So psi really is the new position of a fluid element is its initial position plus some displacement. It's how far you've moved, and it's a vector quantity. So that allows me to rewrite delta V there, so I can rewrite minus I omega delta B is I K B naught times minus I omega the fluid displacement. Just writing the velocity perturbation in terms of the fluid displacement, the minus I omega is cancel, and I have directly an expression for this perturbation to the direction of the magnetic field. This is just equal to I K times the fluid displacement. 
And this is really just a form of flux freezing. It's telling you that how the magnetic field changes is governed by how the fluid moves. Okay. Let's see if I can actually work these boards. Somewhere in here is the board I actually want. <laughs> no. Huh. Oh, yeah, there it is. Good. Okay. So this is all by way of... What I want to do now is I want to substitute what we've just derived into our equation for the heat flux. So delta Q is minus this thermal conductivity times delta B hat, which is I K psi. dotted into grad T. So that's the first term. And then the second term is minus chi I K, get it right, B hat delta T. OK. So we're basically done now. So I can write this as minus I K chi times psi Z dt dz plus delta T times B hat. Right, there's only a background gradient in the Z direction, so psi dot grad T is just psi Z dt dz plus delta T. So that's the perturbation to the heat flux. And then if we want to know in the energy equation what is the divergence of delta Q, that just brings down another IK. So that's K squared chi times psi z dt dz plus delta t. And it's in particular, you'll notice the perturbed heat flux is in the direction of the background B, so it's actually an X component of the heat flux. All right. So this is the expression for the heat flux. Now, the next key translation between math and words is this statement that the thermal conduction time is really short. What does that mean? The thermal conduction time is, in this case, is the time scale to diffuse heat across the wavelength of the perturbation. So the conduction time is like wavelength squared divided by the diffusivity which is 1 over k squared, sorry, yeah, which is 1 over k squared chi. So the conduction time being short is mathematically the statement that k squared chi is very large compared to everything else in the problem. Right? Conduction time is short, means thing in the denominator is big. And really, so I have it here going to infinity, what I really mean is that it's large compared to other frequencies in the problem, like the frequency of the mode. 
So what happens to our equations if I let k squared chi go to infinity? Well, the equations are going to blow up, which is bad, unless this thing in parentheses also goes to zero. So what that means is that rapid conduction implies that psi z dt dz plus delta t is approximately zero. It's, you can think of this as it's kind of you're shorting out the heat flux, you're keeping this thing finite as this goes to infinity by setting this roughly to zero. This thing on the left-hand side is exactly the Lagrangian perturbation to the temperature, the co-moving perturbation to the temperature. So remember, Lagrangian is moving with the displacement. So in general, the Lagrangian change is the Eulerian change plus the displacement dotted into the gradient of the quantity. So what this says is that moving with the blob, the temperature doesn't change. And that's exactly this set of physical arguments I gave you here, that the magnetic field line maintains the same temperature, is mathematically described by this statement that the Lagrangian temperature perturbation vanishes. The final temperature is the same as the initial temperature. As you move along, you retain the same temperature you started with. Okay. And then lastly, I'm going to use pressure equilibrium. Pressure equilibrium says that delta rho over rho plus delta T over T is zero, right? Pressure rho KT over the mass of the proton. I'm not worrying now about composition gradients. So if I say that the pressure perturbation vanishes, that says delta rho over rho plus delta T over T is equal to zero. So I can get rid of delta T here in favor of delta rho. And this just becomes delta rho over rho is equal to psi z times the logarithmic derivative of the temperature, d log t dz. So physically, what does that mean? The setup here, what this tells us is that if psi z is positive and d log t dz, d log t dz is negative, then delta rho over rho will be negative, which means the fluid will be less dense than its surroundings, a negative density perturbation, which means it will be buoyant. That's exactly the situation we drew here. The temperature gradient is negative, corresponds to a buoyancy instability. Okay. okay. So that's then, you can see that actually hidden in all of these nice diagrams is actually a fair amount of physics and a fair amount of subtlety in the argument to tease out of linear perturbation theory, the kind of essence of the physics of the problem. One of the things we didn't get by doing it the way I did it is we didn't actually get the growth rate of the instability. 
What I did is I focused on deriving for you the condition for the instability, which is that the temperature gradient is negative. Negative temperature gradient is what gives me a negative density perturbation, so I'm buoyantly unstable. To derive the actual growth rates of the instability, we would actually have to do the full perturbation theory calculation, keep all the omegas, and not kind of massage things the particular way I did. But this does get at a lot of the physics of the problem. Ten minutes? Okay. All right. <laughs> that took longer than expected. Great, so any questions about that? Specifically, I think what I really wanted to stress was this connection between the heuristic argument and the actual math that goes into the linear perturbation theory calculation. Yep? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, is this an overly idealized problem because it only works for a horizontal magnetic field? It turns out the answer to that is it actually still does exist even if you have a vertical magnetic field, even if you have a vertical component of the magnetic field. Yeah, it doesn't, you're, you're right, then there's a background flow of heat in the vertical direction, and it doesn't wipe out the instability. Um, it changes the growth rates, and it changes some of the things I've talked about here, but it doesn't actually wipe out the instability. So it is more generic than just this setup suggests. But that's a great, that's an important question. Uh, another question, yep. Say it again, does what change? The, the, the yeah, so in this, so in the simulation, is that what you mean? Yeah. So in the simulation, you reach a statistical steady state. The magnetic field gets amplified until roughly the point where the energy in the magnetic field is about equal to the energy in the turbulent motions. And then you have a kind of statistical steady state. Now that's... Yes, so that's what happens in this particular, it doesn't shut itself off. Any other questions? Yep. So, I'm not sure if that's a big question, but how can we estimate the heat flux that this process has? Like, for example, we can Yes, exactly. So, I, I debated doing that, which I didn't do. You can do mixing length theory, if you, if you know mixing length theory in stars, it's a way of estimating the heat flux that results from all this buoyancy and turbulence. You can do mixing length theory for this problem basically identically to how you do it for uh, stars. So it's a very similar set of estimates. The only thing that changes is if you remember doing it in stars, the heat flux is rho V cubed, and V depends on the entropy gradient. Now V depends on the temperature gradient. So very similar set of estimates though. Yeah, good question. Anything else? So, uh, so for the linear theory, if you do the growth, growth rate growth factor calculation, yeah. you would probably end up with an exponential. Yes, so what you get, that's right, you get exponential growth with a growth rate. This board doesn't go up. Um, Exactly, you get a growth rate gamma which is G times D log T D Z. So this thing actually has units of frequency. Um, this is, for those of you who know what the brunt visala frequency is in normal stars and normal convection, this is the analog of that for this problem with temperature gradients. So my question is, like, for these simulations that you did, which are highly nonlinear, yes. I mean, 
So the, the linearly, you can compare the growth rates uh, calculated analytically by what you find in the simulations. This is actually uh, very useful. This is something Jim alluded to. This is a very useful test of your numerical method. So in some of the initial papers on this, so Jim Stone and his student Ian Parrish did the first simulations, nonlinear simulations of this instability. And one of the things they did was show a comparison between analytic theory and the numerical growth rates. That's right. Now, in the nonlinear state, it's more complicated because the linear instability is still there. It's kind of constantly seeding the turbulence. But in the nonlinear state, I'm not sure how you extract a linear growth rate. So the way it's done is by doing a comparison to this very early phase of the simulation. Yep. You mean v dot, v dot grad v? Yes, v dot grad v is zero for this, in linearly, that's right. Yes, exactly. Okay, yep. Yep. So if the magnetic forces, so the way to think about it physically is that as the magnetic forces get too strong, um, it becomes impossible to do this. Whoops it becomes impossible to bend the magnetic field lines. Ah. So you can't have this situation. So when tension is too strong, you suppress the instability. And the rough, very roughly, that happens when the plasma beta is order unity, so that the magnetic forces become comparable to the buoyancy forces. That's the comparison that really matters. Okay. So the, another thing to note here is that imagine we switch the sign of the temperature gradient so that d log t d z is positive, okay? So hot on top, cold on bottom. By this argument, we would say the system is stable. Psi z is positive, delta rho is positive. That looks very stable. Just like for normal convection, if you switch the sign of the entropy gradient, you end up with a stable situation. What's actually remarkable about this problem is that that turns out to be wrong. There's another instability which sets in if you have hot on top of bottom. The physics is actually different. If the physics were the same, then we'd be in trouble because everything I did is right. So this reasoning is correct. What this misses is that the setup we were looking at before, where the magnetic field is perpendicular to the temperature gradient, doesn't allow a background heat flow through the system. So what turns out to make this situation unstable, hot on top, cold on bottom, is if there's actually a component of the magnetic field in the direction of the temperature gradient. So the simplest limit of this instability is when there's a vertical magnetic field in the direction of gravity. In that case, I have hot here, cold here, and my magnetic field is aligned with my temperature gradient, so I have to have a flow of heat because I have conduction. That flow of heat doesn't wipe out the temperature gradient, right, because I can have a constant, I can have a setup to be in steady state, all I require is that the divergence of the heat flux is zero, so it turns out if I have a temperature which is proportional to height, then I have a constant heat flux and I have no divergence of the heat flux. So this setup is a steady state and it turns out to be linearly unstable. The physics is a little more subtle 
It involves tapping into this background heat flux. It turns out that it operates most effectively when the wave vector is at 45 degrees to gravity and the magnetic field. But the way you derive that the system is unstable is exactly the derivation I just gave to you. The critical difference is now this first term isn't zero. B dot grad T is finite in our initial condition. So if you just go through the same algebra that we did, and the notes go through this, what you find is that there's a minus sign there. What that means is now, when the temperature gradient is positive, the density perturbation is negative, and I have a buoyancy instability. So it's analogous physics, but it's tapping into this background heat flux to generate buoyancy. And the other thing that's very important is that now, see if I have this right, yeah. This Lagrangian temperature perturbation, which was zero in the first case, fluid elements conserve temperature as they move, is now non-zero. And it sort of has to be, because you need to somehow heat the fluid as it's rising in order to get it to be buoyant. And that's exactly what happens. You tap into this background heat flux to heat the fluid and generate a buoyancy perturbation that gives you an instability. So here's a simulation of this setup. The saturation is actually a little different. It saturates a little more quiescently. What it does is it actually tries to make the magnetic field relatively horizontal. By making the magnetic field horizontal, it shuts off the heat flux that's driving the instability in the first place. Okay, skip that. Some interesting stuff about viscosity. So the kind of remarkable thing then is that independent of the sign of the temperature gradient, weakly magnetized low collisionality plasmas are actually convectively unstable. The way you shut this off is you either make the magnetic field very strong so the field can't bend. That's why this doesn't operate in the solar corona. Or you make the dominant diffusive flow of heat be something that's isotropic, that doesn't care about the direction of the magnetic field, and that's what happens in the interior of the sun. And that's why people didn't actually kind of discover this in the context of studying the sun, is because it doesn't operate in the sun. Where it operates is in low collisionality, more weakly magnetized astrophysical plasma. And the case where there's been the most work on this and the most interest in this set of instabilities is in the hot plasma in galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 solar mass dark matter halos filled with very hot 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin gas, low densities, uh, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 particles per centimeter cubed, so the mean free path of electrons is actually quite large. Thermal conduction is very important. And there's a lot of ongoing work studying the instabilities that I just described to you in the context of galaxy clusters. I think we don't fully understand, I think this really is an area of continuing research where we don't still fully understand all of the implications of these instabilities for galaxy clusters, but it's a very active area of research. So uh, I'll stop there. I didn't get to anything about disks and differential rotation, which is totally fine because Charles G Gammy is going to give you a lecture entirely on astrophysical disks, and you're going to hear a lot more about disks uh, later in the rest of the summer school. So I'll stop there and take any additional questions. Thanks.